Hello, and welcome to the Dolby Institute podcast. This is a show about how artists use technology to tell their stories, and I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. If you're curious to know more about the Dolby Institute, please head on over to dolbyinstitute.com. There you will find information on all of our programs. You can access the entire library of episodes of this podcast, and you can sign up for our mailing list. Welcome to our coverage of this year's Academy Award nominations. Like last year, we have compiled interviews with each of the five nominees in the best sound category. So if you are an Academy member filling out your Oscar ballot, or if you are just filling out your ballot for your annual office pool, we hope that you'll get a much better idea of what to watch for and more importantly, to listen for from these conversations with the artists who are nominated for their respective films. Here are the nominees in alphabetical order. All Quiet on the Western Front, Avatar The Way of Water, The Batman, Elvis, and Top Gun Maverick. With the exception of Elvis, which we were only able to record recently because of everyone's very busy schedules, each of these conversations is an excerpt from a longer podcast conversation that we recorded with these teams over the course of the past several months. So each of these episodes is available in full in our back catalog of the podcast. For your convenience, we'll have an index with time codes for each of the segments in our show notes, along with links to each of the individual episodes, So if you'd like to learn more, I encourage you to go back and check out the full conversations in each one of those episodes. All right, so obviously this is a very big episode. We got five films to talk about with a ton of special guests. So let's jump right in. First up in alphabetical order is All Quiet on the Western Front. In this discussion from our episode number 139, we spoke with nominees re-recording mixer Lars Genzel, production sound mixer Victor Prezel, sound supervisor and sound designer Frank Cruz, and unfortunately, Stefan Corti, who is also nominated in this category, was unable to join us at the time of this meeting. Uh, each of these gentlemen is celebrating his very first Academy Award nomination, and also joining this conversation was the writer and director of the film, Edward Berger. This looks like it was a very difficult film to shoot. Uh, obviously, you know, uh, Frank talked about the mud and the grit and the dirt. Uh, you really got a sense of the horrible conditions in the trenches for these guys. And of course, I'm watching the film thinking the horrible conditions for the production sound mixer as well to capture in those circumstances. And I'm sure those, I'm sure those period vintage costumes were quite noisy, uh, as well. And there were lots of mun- munitions and pyrotechnics going off. So, Victor, can you talk about the process of capturing the production sound and uh, and how you were able to uh, uh, to get as clean a recordings as you did? Well, the battle scenes were really challenging, uh, but we had a good idea from the pre-production what uh, to expect. Pre-production was extremely uh, important to us, especially the cooperation with the costume department. We did a couple of tests during the costume fittings to find the right place where to put radios. That was crucial thing. We also knew from James Friend, the DOP, that he would be using uh, lent- wide lenses and everything will be in motion. So we had to be 100% sure with our radios, radio mics. So every actor uh, from the main group was wearing two radio mics, uh, one in costume and one in helmet. There were several reasons for that. Uh, one of the reasons was dynamic range. Uh, the actors were going from whispering to screaming in one take. So each of the radios would set the, the different sensitivity. And the another reason was because the actors were crawling or running or pointing a gun. So the microphone in the costume wasn't always usable, unfortunately. And what we knew from the beginning was the bread is absolutely essential for us and for the movie. I would say as important as the dialogue uh, because the bread completely drops you into the action and the helmets were essential in this because we could get really close with the microphone and actors can turn their head and uh, it was still there. 
they could do everything what they wanted and it worked great i would say and about uh, about the location uh that that was crazy yeah yeah frank so so did you did you have a wish list that you asked victor and his team to get for you of those uh of vehicles and whatnot the wish list was pretty simple it was just just get everything you can you know literally um everything that's possible everything that's interesting even what I really love about uh, love to to preserve in films like these are like even the mistakes, the so-called like something that we would call like you know unusable sound is super important to get these you know get close to the uh, to the characters when they fall into the mud, have the you know even have the the microphone bumping into the dirt and stuff like that. It makes it really visceral and and like gets you uh, gets the audience into the action because this film is so much about you know moving from first person perspective to to an observer and back so even even getting all that stuff in there even the, the mistakes was important but this thing was really wild track paradise i must say uh like edward said all the vehicles were captured in multi-tracks you know high sample rates etc Everything was there, these huge crowd recordings with multiple microphones, surround mics, extra booms at the same time, plus laughs, etc. So I don't know, Marcus, do you want to, I think you counted them at some point. It was a crazy number. I was so impressed uh, by what we received from set. And so the library, I can't remember a movie we've worked on where we received such an extensive uh, library of wild tracks, actually. It was maybe close to 400 or something and then apart from the wild tracks even every take was, was gold for us because uh before or after or during the take there were always uh snippets which um uh might not have ended up in the in the actual uh edit but for us sound wise uh there were lots of snippets that had so much character and and uh sparked ideas for us uh some of them we've used uh um as elements other ones were just uh yeah brought us further in thinking about how things could sound and uh the sheer load of material was was huge like uh and yeah for us it was the, the perfect uh, starting point lars i would love to hear from your perspective about mixing the sequence together and and how you because obviously there's just such a tremendous amount going on but in 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 the spirit of what edward was saying when we first started uh, i love the sense of directionality and clarity and focus i feel like maybe in this mix more than anything else you were subtracting rather than adding yes absolutely it's it's a uh, um i don't know i uh, yeah i'm i'm sure we've we've raised a couple of elements here and there but like i i would say 90% of the time during the final we just try to find those elements that would make a real difference and and subtract those so um one thing for for instance um especially in those bigger battle sequences that we found out after a while was there because frank and marcus had had several layers of of fighting sounds of guns and crowds shouting and so there there was a uh, these helped to create a, a sense of density um or also in in, in in terms of depth of field and all of that but um having one of the one certain layer of those gunshots which was actually the furthest away or not having it would make make a tremendous difference about how much of that battle you could actually take and in a sense um because you also asked about like okay how how do did we approach like recreating the the reality of of those battles uh, in a, in a sense that like the the density of everything um it it was not it, we had a had an, had an urge to try to make it um sort of pay tribute to to what those soldiers uh, reported back to to their families in in letters but um one of the things that we noticed during the mix that was even more important was like how do we keep it bearable for the audience? 
and that's why subtracting was so so hugely important to to find that one element that would just break the line or or, or just um, be the last drip of water, and then the bucket would overflow. And and so that that's like a lot of subtraction and just finding the right beats and the right passages of just taking one layer out and then it would be just feel like, okay, that's just about right. I think one of the other things that was, um, that's sticking out to me in, in terms of the, the mix and, and the character of the film or the, the film soundtrack is really that um, we, we try to keep things distinct. So, and and also in terms of the dynamics of the film, it's not just that we go from loud to low to quiet, and and it there's a there's a lot of shifts of of density, and um and often and and also in terms of uh, spatial width. So there there are a couple of scenes which are really basic and very very narrow, very quiet and and, and concentrated, but then there are also quiet scenes that are wide. Because there's there's some wind moving and and there's just one element coming from the side and and then again that becomes overwhelming and it's this mass of everything, but even in the mass of everything we try to keep the focus for for the audience to to have something to hang on to, um, because we want to guide the audience in a way that it it still they can follow what uh what what paul and and his friends are going through in those battle scenes you've all talked about dynamic range but I, some of my favorite sound moments in this movie are very quiet and very specific after that first uh battle sequence in the trench when paul is walking along and he steps on what turns out to be his friend's glasses When I heard that crunch and then I saw the next shot is the glass is lying in the mud, immediately I knew what had happened. And it was just such an emo I had such an emotional response that was triggered by that sound. Uh, I thought that was just a genius moment. And then, you know, the the night when they're driving, they're being driven to the to the front. And uh it's very tense. And you Edward, you stage that in a wide shot on the road with all these vehicles, and one by one they turn off their headlights as they get closer to the front so that they won't get shot at. But it's a very simple scene, but we just hear each vehicle turning off its lights. And uh, to me, that's just pow very powerful storytelling through sound. I'm so glad you noticed those. And those sounds are sometimes uh, too loud for what they realistically would be. Obviously headlights turning off don't have a sound. And those glasses, I remember us talking, well, it's pretty loud for a pair of glasses in the mud, you know, like it's, it's almost like a window breaking. But it's it's just to Paul. It sounds it's that's the sound that Paul it goes through his bones. That's really the the thing we try to chase, like to constantly think about. You know, whose perspective are we currently in? Like, are we with Paul coming out of that the rubble of the bunker, and then like his after having this hearing loss moment, like having his hearing actually heightened, so this tiny glass sound becomes, you know, a little bit larger than life, but just this tiny, this tiny bit to keep it uh, naturalistic as well. Uh, more, for most of the time, this is kind of a, I think, a key idea for the soundtrack on this film to not have it. There are very few moments that are actually designy in a way, you know, designy in a artificial way. We always, uh, we obviously create all these like hearing, uh, like these, these, um, uh, bubble moments uh, acoustically, but they're always kind of based on, uh, I would say, simplistic idea, not, uh, let's say, like um, naturalistic ideas for sounds that we use and how we use them in the film without becoming like overly, you know, drench drenching everything in reverb and all these tricks of the trade that we all know. And so, yeah, that's kind of a, that, that was a kind of a, uh, a path we try to follow. Edward, you take us on such a roller coaster of emotions through this film. There's, there's been a very, very 
visceral hand-to-hand combat in the trench, then almost a lighthearted moment when the German soldiers find all this food and they start to gorge themselves. And then my favorite sound moment, one of my favorites in the film, when we start to hear the rumbling of the French tanks that are coming and that wonderful shot with all the rats disappearing. Uh, and then and then the French tanks show up. So can you talk, uh, Frank and Marcus, about building that particular sequence when the French tanks show up and Lars about mixing it, please? When they enter the kitchen, they're really grabbing all the food they, they can find. And it was actually a great um, foley job. Um, um, you hear lots of foley then, and it really makes it real. And then all of a sudden the rumble starts and... Um, at at that point of of the story, the these soldiers had not yet faced um, tanks of of that size, so they didn't really know where all the rumble was was coming from. And um, so th- they leave the these uh, sort of field kitchen in a hurry and and line up in the trenches. And and for us, sound wise, um, we thought about how we could um, support that. Um, well mystery so to speak because um as i said they, they didn't know where this was coming from so um we we had the choice of either well creating this big wall of engine sounds of a tank division approaching but then we thought it would be more interesting to focus just on the effect that these tanks had so the as you mentioned, the vibration, the shaking, uh, and these these rats, and I think we also added uh, like little jumping pebble stones when they're when we are seeing them in the lining up in the trenches. Although we don't see the stones jumping, but it added uh, the feeling that they had. And then, um, so the idea really was to to go with them in terms of like keeping the mystery up and. Um, and then just when these um, tanks appear at the horizon, that's, that, that's where we finally start hearing them. All before, it's also like um, rather ominous sounds that echo through the fog. So it's kind of mirroring what they see because they didn't really see the tanks. Uh, so we kind of, we try to mirror that in the sound. And then once the tanks uh, show up, then all hell breaks loose, so to speak. I mean, this probably go- also goes back to your question about how accurate uh, can you be in such a film? You know, who 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 knows how stuff sounded back then, etc. Um, so, but pretty early on, we decided to not approach this challenge by trying to be ultimately scientifically accurate to have the exact proper gunshot, the exact grenade impact the exact tank sound of that time because in in the emotion of of these scenes you always want to be you know tell the story from the emotional point of view it it doesn't really it doesn't really help that scene for example that you mentioned if you had the the ultimate 100% super accurate sound of the of those um of the belt drives you know grinding or the engine sound etc so we we just wanted to, these these tanks to become these iron mon- monsters, kind of referring to the the war machinery that was ongoing, and the soldiers being these characters trying to avoid becoming the very soil they were wading through, you know, and all that that kind of that was a kind of the idea and the approach uh, approach behind the sound, and uh, yeah, to to always think about the emotion in 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 these scenes and less about you know, is this really the absolute accurate engine from 1918 at, at the right RPM, etc.? cetera? That's, uh, in, in other films, that, that's totally fine. But in this one, it felt kind of wrong to, to chase, chase down that road. And then in the end, who, who knows, you know, what, what, that, uh, what war really sounds from, especially when you're in that extreme situation. In that the whole sequence with the, with the tanks approaching, um, I think... At least once they come out of out of out of that uh, bunker with all the food, um, another element that that starts changing everything is the music that kicks in, and that was a big challenge 
during the mix, finding the right way of how to integrate music and, and sound effects with each other because we have this low rumble and also the music starts on a very ominous note. So everything blends quite easily with each other, which is fine for a while. But once, like, like Marcus said, hell breaks loose, then um, it was really important to have a sense of separation between music and and the sound effect, because otherwise you don't, you're losing the beat of the music. And once you lose, lose that, then, um, you, you sort of really lose the music or you have to push it too hard. And so that was a very delicate, um, balance and, and actually a delicate transition of finding the right levels of how, how to set this up. So we don't end up, uh, louder and, and everything than, than necessary. Yeah, very much so. And I appreciate the um, the conversation about the the war machine and kind of how that actually dovetails in the sound of war. Frank, you brought up the, the sewing machine, that factory sequence. And I mean, you know, Edward, you were talking before about hard cuts and sound and, and, and how that kind of jars the viewer. But one of the things that I noticed was the amazing use of sound and sound design as a transition element. And I loved there was that that particular sequence I made note of with the the factory sewing machines that then becomes the machine gun sounds on the field, and then that becomes like the 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 one of the truck engines. Like I, I, you guys, you were very poetic about your use of sound as well, not just hard cuts. Thank you. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I accept the thanks on behalf of the sound crew. <laughs> there was also that that transition to the first battlefield, like which is basically just from the from the trees onto the battlefield and it seems so super simple now and i think i don't know we did five or six versions of that because edward was never quite satisfied of there was something like in in the in the really like micro timing of how things blend that really just needed to to find its place so it really shows like how how precise edwards uh imagination is already about something how he wants things which is the the real key that helps us do our job the way we do it um and with the the i don't know with a um uh with the degree of of um of precision that we try to put into it um it it's that precise idea that he's able to to bring to us um that's the key. Many thanks to the sound team behind All Quiet on the Western Front. Next up is Avatar, The Way of Water. In this discussion from our episode number 140, we spoke with nominees Christopher Boys, the re-recording mixer, supervising sound editor, and sound designer, who is marking his 15th Academy Award nomination, and Chris has four previous wins. Also supervising sound editor Dick Bernstein with his first uh, nomination for a competitive Oscar, although he has won a Technical Achievement Award Oscar in the past. Re-recording mixer Michael Hedges with his fifth Academy Award nomination, and he's won twice in the past. Production sound mixer Julian Howarth with his first Academy Award nomination, and supervising sound editor Gwendolyn Yates Whittle with her third Oscar nomination. Unfortunately, Gary Summers, who is the dialogue and music mixer on the film with his 12th Oscar nomination, wasn't able to join us when we sat down with the team to discuss the film. What's been probably the, the biggest task for me early on and remained a challenge right until the last day really was uh, that the dialogue coming from the Talkoon, um, which are the, uh, they are, you know, effectively marine mammals. And they are, you know, are very much characters in the film and, and have a language of their own. And what, what's fun for the audience is that they, they come to learn that, um, well, and through Loak, which is uh, one of the Sully family uh, kids, we, we, we get introduced to Piacon and, and, and Loak and Piacon figure out that they can talk and, and Loak sort of comes to understand Piacon and Piacon comes to understand Loak. And that's all sort of through this, you know, sound designed language. And that was 
kind of my biggest challenge on the film in a design sense that started really early on. For me, the character of Pyacon, you know, was one of the main characters of the film and was a character that I became as emotionally invested in as any uh, of the Navi. And I, I know that a lot of that is due to the, you know, the reactions that I was having to, you know, to his vocalizations. So can you talk about, uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious about what the experimental, you know, the, the, so if you started with that for five years and you said it went until the very end, tell us about like, were you, what, what, what were some of the blind alleys that you went down? What did you try that didn't work and how did you finally kind of unlock it? That was the, uh, you're exactly right. I mean, what I did initially was I put together, well, well first of all, I, I, my son, Daniel, uh, put together a, a trip for uh, myself and Lucas Miller, who also worked on the film. The three of us flew to Maui and um, had an amazing recording experience recording Humpback Whales um, that to this day, I don't, I've never heard vocalizations the way we captured them. Um, so I was pretty excited about that. And, and then uh, when I mentioned that to Jim, he, he wasn't too excited about that. So, so therein lies, you know, <laughs> the beginning of a path. So what, so then I thought, okay, well, wait, 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 wait a second. Jim wasn't too excited about it because he didn't he didn't want it to be too close to actual humpback whales or like what yeah, was yeah I think or he, just, he or was just like, Jim well, doesn't get excited about stuff in general no 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 I mean he he was at that time he was sort of describing you know he he likened it to other and I'm not going to use any of the examples but he likened it to other characters that didn't ever speak a known human language but became characters in film throughout history and that you know, I needed to think about it from that perspective. And I think really what he was saying about the humpbacks is, is he loves the species, obviously. I mean, he's, whales are a big part of his vision. But I think his, his feeling was that humpbacks tend to be um, one of the most recognizable uh, marine mammal vocalizations to all of us. And, and, and they also tend to be really sing-songy. And, and all of that didn't really... In truth, didn't really lend itself to um, to creating a dialogue, and and so what I did initially was I basically got into my sound design room at Skywalker, and for two weeks I I pulled through every recording. I had Lucas search every corner of the planet for um, you know sounds that we could purchase and and and, and license, and. Um, I, I poured through every single recording I could and started creating components, basically using, actually at the time, a, a contact, which is a native instruments uh, program. Because um, typically I'd go to my Synclavier, but I, I actually found contact to be more appropriate for what I was doing. So I just went through all these recordings and found components and created as many, literally hundreds and hundreds of vocalizations and then, and then Dave put him in the library. But you also had this great idea that he was that PyCon, like Loak, was a a teenager in 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 a lonely teenager, like an outcast. And so we also we recorded human vocals just because I actually recorded my neighbor kids just to, and I, I kind of I, I made up a thing for them to say or like a scenario. I didn't tell them what it was about, and uh, they made up their own language, kind of like on the spot, and we tried it but it's always still felt too human. I mean, but it was a, it was a nice idea to kind of go to a, a, a lonely teenager. Yeah, that, and that was one of the many, um, many paths that I went down that um, we were really excited about. I, I, I basically, I pulled Gwen into the process because I, I thought to myself, well, you know, nobody's better at dialogue than Gwen. And, and, and I said, Gwen, what if we actually record humans and I process that? And, and we also, we used these wonderful recordings that Gwen made of her, of her neighbors, as well as Kevin Dorman, who was actually, who actually performed uh, on the mocap, well, I don't know, the performance capture stage, performed a lot of PyCon. Um, you know, trying to capture what, what Jim was hearing, what like he was his head. Doing. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and in the end, um, I'll try and wrap it up because it is, a, it's a big thing, but in the end, Jim got a hold of this big library that I, I made and, and wisely, I wasn't really thinking about, I mean, I think I was thinking about PyCon a little bit, but I was thinking about Tolkien in general. And I, 
I wisely sort of named these all with emotional components like sad, angry, rage, um, happy, uh, you know, like I really divided it into every emotion I could and attack, you know, where the file spoke to me a certain emotion, I would give it that name. And, and uh, unbeknownst to me, Jim started playing with, well, I mean, I guess I knew that he was playing with that, but he, he really started to dig into that early library and get some things that were working for him. And, and so as much as anything, T Piacon was a, was a collaboration really in the end between Jim and I, but I didn't really realize that for a long time because we kept thinking, no, we need to get more, we need to be more dialogue oriented. We need to work with the, the pacing and rhythm, which we did ultimately, but the pacing of rhythm of dialogue as we know it, as we understand it so that it would make sense to us. So it has a cadence. So right. And then, then when I flew down to New Zealand, I, I started playing with other components, even musical instruments and things of that nature. And I developed about three different passes. And, and I played, I think, the first or second pass to Jim. And he goes, no, no, no. What, did, what do I have in the track now? <laughs> well, he, was, he had gotten used to what he had in the track now. And, and I was fine with that. I was absolutely fine with that. Um, and then just to complete it, then, you know, we, we actually then kind of went with that and I started augmenting it with other components of sounds that I'd made. And, 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 and once we got to a place where he, he felt like it was really working, then he said, you know, I think it would be fun to do something in addition to this that's based on, you know, whistles and, and things of that nature. So then I, I, which was really exciting. Now I had some feedback. We had a base to work with and I went back to my, um, room at Park Road Post then. And I, again, on contact, I found all these marine mammal whistles and then little enunciations. And I performed all these things. And, and in the, the scene that we put out for the Academy, the, the, the very first scene where we meet Piacon, you see all of that at play. And it's, I think it's really fun because you have this dialogue, but then he, when he gets excited and he's just you know, kind of not saying anything specific. He uses these whistles and, and it, it's, it's a lot of fun. You guys started in Manhattan Beach, uh, which is in, you know, n near Los Angeles. And so was that where, where the mocap was happening? And then, and then the live action, because there's, a, you know, just a, there's a, a tremendous amount of live action uh, with the humans that are, uh, that are on Pandora. Now, was that shot in New Zealand or what was kind of the division of things and how did you guys, at what point did you guys go to park road? Like kind of walk me through the va the various phases of the production. It, it started, it started all of the, the planning and everything. As you, as you know, Chris built the thing at Manhattan beach and then we built three, uh, performance capture stages. There were two side by side that we could join together to make an even bigger volume that we use for the regular performance capture. And then we built, and then once we started performance capture, you know, late 2017, um, we, we started on the two volumes. And the, in that time we were building the water tank on the third volume. And that was again, ongoing testing to make sure that we can do performance capture underwater to make the cameras work. Is it a different, you know, it's a different light. It's infrared. Is it ultraviolet? It's all those questions that were being asked. And, and we were having to answer while we were filming on the first two stages. Um, and then you were getting questions about, you know, how, how can we develop that? We had a test tank on a fourth stage just for the hell of it. I mean, why not? Um, <laughs> and it was that constant research and development to, you know, to, 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 to fine tune it. Cause you knew, and, and you know, in 2017, we, we, you know, we knew we were going into a water stage and this, and, and there were various problems. And it was, we were kind of um, eight months after that, we knew we'd start to film in it. So you kind of had this eight month lead in where you would, I, I remember I was like nervous as because we were building things, we were building things that were going to water tank, would it work? How would we do like communication underwater? How would they do the capture? How would we make, oh, you know, how would I make a microphone work from 30 foot under the water to break at the surface and be working? You know, all the, all those questions and, and you know, and, and, and more with all the other departments is like, how do we get that? And it was a huge collaboration from everybody. You know, there was no, there was no point where you kind of have a distinctive job at this point. Everybody overlapped, you know, even in our sound department here, everybody, like Gwen with Chris is, we all overlapped. I overlapped with Dick and with Simon Frank. And it was like a big, a huge collaboration, which was, which is, you know, massively um, satisfying, frankly, then, you know, it's, you normally get these, 
these corridors that you've got to stay in. And when you get to overlap and collaborate a bit more, it's, it's, it's like this huge appreciation of the people you're working with, what they do and how they do it, you know. And, and then all of this is just to keep up with Jim. And he's he just, I want to do this. And you kind of go, okay, and I, how long have we got? And you're like, oh, eight months, you know. And, and, and I can remember the first comment I got from him, sorry to detract about this, I remember the first comment is, is to enable performance capture on a, in water for the cameras to work. We had to cover the surface. Of, we'll talk about this later as well with Gwen. The surface of the water is covered with like 10,000 ping pong balls, which sound horrific. Um, and, and I don't know if this is a podcast or not, but I can remember talking to Jim about it. He's like, look, we've got this. What are your expectations? You know, it, it's that grab five minutes, try and get as much information out of him as you can, and then, and then you can work with it. And I was like, you know, what do we want? He said, look, I said, he said, all I'm worried about is not hearing the goddamn fucking balls. And that was it. <laughs> that, that was his first. He says, I, I don't want to hear those goddamn balls. And I was like, well, balls indeed, Jim. And I, and he you kind of go away, like, what can we do? So, it, it, you know, it was developed from that. And then we went to the tank. Um, and then, you know, it was two years later. Then we started, we'd been filming in the tank in terms of timeline. Then we started to build, crew came up from New Zealand to meet us. We had a lot of things that we kind of invented to kind of help on the mock-up stage that, that Jim wanted to take down to New Zealand. Again, we'll, we can talk about that a bit more. Um, and so then we developed, at that point, when everybody started to come up, it was the, the um, 3D cameras to test those out. With Those were all tested. So the systems were tested in Manhattan Beach. So everything was built. We had a spider cam, which was an island camera that went through the actual live sets which played back the animation of the Navi to the humans so we could you could have a moving eye line so everybody on set you know to make it look right because that's always the thing with CGI in a, in a in a live action shoot is eye lines tend not to look great or that you've got somebody waving about a tennis ball that doesn't quite fit in and it was trying to make that work you know and, and, and again full collaboration it's a spider cam grips We've got playback from um, the mocap, the, the performance capture guys, the motion builders. Um, we've got a, you know a, a directional speakers on the spider cam, so the blue person could talk, or he could talk into earpieces. So we had that, and then we also, you know, and it was making that work. And then, then it was also uh, the initial costume review of like where we were going to put radio mics in costumes, you know, and then this how we're going to work with that spider, our big. Uh, our big concern is is a guy, you know, it's the Tarzan thing, isn't it? A guy in a loincloth in a wide shot, and Jim wants to hear tight dialogue. What are you going to do? And at that point, and he's I always think, wearing a mask. And he's always he's always wearing a mask, you know. But it, you know, those masks are without, and you can build things in. But there's sometimes he's inside and he's not wearing a mask. It's like, and again, what are you going to do? And we built. So his, his radio mic and his microphone was built into his wig. So one of the dreadlocks is actually his transmitter in his, in his hairpiece. I'm exhausted just listening to all that. It's what an, what an extraordinary achievement. And of course, you know, leave it to Jim Cameron. You know, he can never, he can never make a film uh, in, a, in a simple fashion. It's got to be groundbreaking at every... So Gwen, you know, it's, it's very rare that we have the production sound mixer with us for these uh, conversations. So uh, not to put you on the spot, but... Julian's right here. How did he do? How the how were those production tracks? It sounds like it was a very challenging setup. He was really great. I mean, the the, the balls in, in the pool was probably the worst thing we had to deal with because there's balls in the pool and you can't do anything about that. They, they, I remember that's the day we actually went to the set and, and I, I I saw you and you kind of looked at me. And you went because 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 what are you going to do? But um, we used I, I'd say we used probably 75 percent of all the production that was recorded um we did adr for extra stuff extra breathing things that kind of thing as the cgi came in we we would do that what does that mean exactly is that is that sort of like is that sort of like adr for the performance capture of the face or what what exactly is so it's that kind of thing where they would did they he you could play jim would play them the performance that they did either with, with the balls or, or with, with some, some others weird squeaky, you know, plywood thing underneath it. And they would record the face as well as the voice. So it's kind of ADR with the face so that they can animate to the new performance if Jim likes it better. And it helps with make sync a lot easier if, if they do it right. Um, so there was a lot of that. They did a lot of that with Spider um, as he grew up because Spider started as 12 years old and then he was 
17 and he sounded very different. So they had to uh, kind of put the, 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 the older spider into all these scenes. So a lot of his stuff was done FPR because they could, they had to, they would record all his facial expressions at the same time. Um, we did do some traditional ADR, not a ton, but uh, um, some of the water stuff that Tony Johnson did on these boats where they're just screaming into these mics, just because that, that stuff kind of had to just for major distortion and Tony did the best he could, but that's again, it's kind of like the balls in the pool. It's kind of like a, luckily we do have ADR, which is a very powerful tool and we, we used it. And uh, I mean, there's also um, this miraculous program that Peter Jackson's people came up with and our lead dialogue editor, Marty Kwok, he was one of the lead designers on it. They used it on Get Back, it's called MAL, M-A-L. And it was really great also for overlaps, but it could take, if, if you had two people overlapped, it would it would figure out the voices and separate them. And it would keep the, the performances and there was no artifacting. And so you could have, you know, Kiri and Lowak and, and, and you could then, you know, just pull them apart. Or if you had these ball things, it would separate the ball noise from the sound of the water and then the voice. And it was pretty remarkable. And then of course, I think one of the performances that just struck me so beautiful Zoe Saldana's performance as Natiri, just extraordinary, so emotional. And so how much of that was captured during the mocap and how much of that was ADR? Or we are doing motion capture, but we're also capturing emotion. This was the whole bit when you said about Zoe Saldana, we're there to not just capture motion, we're capturing emotion. And that's why we kind of try and refer it as a performance capture stage because that's what Avatar is. It's not just... We're not just doing it. We're capturing. It's everything that they're doing. We're capturing, um, and and that transferal and like you said, that performance from Zoe is outstanding. I mean, it, it floors me every time. She's incredible, and and so and it's so natural. Um, as for how much we used, I, you know, we, I'm there to try and protect performances as much as we can. Um, you know, ADR is a tool that you know. I, again, as as, as a as a production mixer. I, I don't feel ashamed about ADR. It's, it's, a, it's a marvelous tool and it's a creative tool and it's, and it's everything that we do. So it's, it, it's, it's a, it's a balance between the two. We also um, so recorded it too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we, re I re recorded that too. So it's, you know, it's, it's a tool that I, that I, you know, I, you know, we love, but the thing I think I, I remember about Zoe in the performance that, that get me and Dick will attest to this is, um, and I know I pipe on about it, but it's like, it, it, I'm really quite proud of it is the song chord that Zoe sings. That was recorded on stage. That was not recorded in a studio. That was that was recorded on stage at Manhattan Beach. Simon and Dick came down, we brought the track. We started to rehearse the little track. We worked, we worked on to get the pitch right with Zoe. And then she just went and hammered that whole song out on the stage and that was it. There was no studio work without, you know, and, and that's, you know, for those kind of things, we, we worked really hard to protect that performance. Amazing. Dick, you've been so patient. I want to bring you into the conversation here. Uh, it, so, uh, Dick, I know that, that you work, uh, you, you worked really closely with the composer, Simon Franklin, and, and obviously, um, you know, we, uh, James Horner did the score for the original film and did such a, a beautiful job on it. Tragically, he passed away before Avatar 2 went into production. Uh, so Simon stepped in. Uh, can you talk about your process collaborating with Simon? And obviously, you know, as Julian just told us, there was a certain amount of pre-recording that happened, um, and and that process of integrating the score into the sound design. Yeah, James's death left a huge hole uh, in our team. Uh, Simon was Simon, and Simon Rhodes, our uh, scoring mixer. Uh, other people were were part of James's team, and after. We had already started uh, having meetings with Disney about the world of Avatar uh, in Disney World in Florida. And uh, after James's death, uh, Simon Franklin continued and completed the world of Avatar. And I was uh, lucky enough to be able to help out on that. And I, part of it was that since we had been working in that Avatar world, uh, we got Simon got tapped to do the onset music, the songs, uh, some dancing and some rituals uh, for the performance capture. So uh, Julian ran the playback and we were there and we were also part of a 
team that they called it the culture team, which was kind of putting our heads together to uh, work on what an indigenous culture should look like. And uh, Simon invented some musical instruments uh, that then got 3D printed. And that was, uh, I guess we started doing that in about 2018. The, the, the Disney stuff uh, for Avatar World was 2016. Uh, and then eventually Simon got tapped to do the final score. And uh, we got moved down to New Zealand. He got there in January of last, of, yeah, last year now. And uh, I got there in April. And various other members of the team came and left. Stephen Baker, orchestrator. Um, Darren Hall, music editor. Um, Darren uh, Graham, Graham Foote, another orchestrator. And, uh, and Simon Rhodes came down for months. And uh, I got to meet hedges and we kind of worked in isolation uh at that point because of covid stuff and the score was being developed and then everything came together uh, on the mixing stage that's when finally we all caught up with each other and uh had to deal with the collision of worlds and it became apparent within the first couple of weeks that we were all going to have to set aside everything and work together and support each other and become a coherent, cohesive whole because we were fighting this looming deadline and there was so much to do and so many hours and kind of relentless concentration. And uh, I we really had to become, unlike any picture I've ever worked on, a, a team. And uh, we had this whiteboard out in the hall and every day we would see the, the days ticking off and uh, had our meals together and... Uh, yeah, that was your job, when, uh, So it was uh, Jim Cameron sculpted the whole second by second the sound of the movie, and uh, certainly uh, he had his fingers in the music deeply. Everything had to go through him before it got to the stage, and uh, you know we all compromised and we all gave way and we all worked together and took our turns and. Uh, We've got a product that really coheres and is transparent enough that you can hear what's going on. But one of the things that stood out for me both the times that I've watched the film is just the astonishing, astonishing to me, just the clarity of the track. I believe it was maybe coined on Terminator, but it was a, a term that Jim has used in the past, which we've all sort of, uh, you know, recanted many times. And that, that is, you know, clarity is king. And, um, you know, that, that really was the edict that we worked under. And the, the problem with getting clarity or transparency, and, and, and you really kind of hit it on the head, Glenn, it, 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 it's all of the departments, music, dialogue with crowds and all of this. And then obviously the sound effects world with, you know, backgrounds. Foley, and then what we call hard effects, which are the more traditional sound effects. We deliver a palette that it really can't play. All of that just can't play. And um, in fact... I mean, it can't play together. It can't play all at once. It can't play all at once without it being just a collision of, of ideas and components. The problem, the problem is that, that, that you can't say, okay, well, if, if they can't all play together, then just pick the pieces that... W- Will play well as Dick pointed out. You pick those pieces second by second or frame by frame, and and um, so in order to get a transparent track, which is what a film like Avatar desperately needs, you it, it's it's exactly what you said, Glenn. It's subtraction. It's subtraction of backgrounds. It's subtraction of foley. It's subtraction of sound effects. But in the music department, which Mike and Dick can speak to, it's it's listening to a cue and saying, great, well, w- these beating drums are happening while we have gunfire on screen. We, we have to support that gunfire. Therefore, the drums are not going to play. And, and, and that's um, kind of, you know, like known to us as mixers, but very few directors, a lot of times, I, a lot of times directors just won't sort of be willing to, to take apart their music to support their gunfire for instance, and, and um, Jim has no fear of doing that. And, and that's a good thing. It, it's hard on all of us because 
you know, we're, we're taking away these components that we would really play in and of themselves, by themselves, play amazingly well. Um, but that was the edict that we worked through. And um, in order to get there, it was frame by frame, second by second, and multiple, you know, we would go through and get it sort of working. We'd do a, a playback. Then we'd spend another day going through and, and cleaning and, 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 and really sort of focusing and, and this just went on for a, a really long time. And that whiteboard just kept getting updated and updated. And, and, and in the end, Avatar visually is such a complicated image. And I think the human brain can easily take that in and enjoy it. But we, delivering the sound of Avatar, have to work against that because the human brain can look at all those beautiful visuals but can't necessarily process a thousand different sonic notions. Really, we want to simplify it and, and get the, the sound to speak to the story that we're trying to tell. And, it, and if it's not part of the story, it doesn't belong in the track. And, and what that comes down to is, is, a, is a track that in many ways is very simplified so that we're telling the story. It's well put, Chris. I think, um, the big thing for us was that Jim was so precise, and I think we've all said it, it was a long period, and Dick, you said that deadline was looming, um, and I think that played a part on, on Jim being um, extremely detailed. He wanted to go through each department, he would start with the dialogue, he would make sure that we're hearing every line, every breath, which became so important in Avatar. Um, <coughs> Then we would go through the music, and and there were a huge score. There's there's three hours of score which um, plays magnificently. It's Simon and Dick and Darren um, work so hard on presenting not just a score but an emotional um, journey that we that we went on that was that was orchestrated with um, with native instruments with so many different things. Uh, and 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 that had to play um, against music and effects. And as Chris said, we would we would work work with the the score. We would listen against the dialogue. Then we would add in Chris's department. And Jim was precise. He would he would go through it, choose what he wanted. We would then run the reel. Um, and sometimes they were a traffic traffic crash. You know, it was. Uh, there were, there were quite a few moments where we were going, oh, my God, that didn't work. And, um, you know, tension built in the room, um, let's say. Um, <laughs> but, again, it was it was uh, a process that had to happen, and we would get notes. We would work through those notes, and we think, oh, we're done. No, we'll watch it again. Jim will sit in his, his chair, and he'll listen, and he'll go, okay, we, we didn't get it quite right. We'll go back, and we'll refine those moments. Um and I think, I think to to the the beauty and the emotion of, of Avatar, the the score, the sound effects, the environments, you get captivated by all of those things, and you forget that every piece of water is actually created, every drum beat is created, every vocal is created, um, and you you get captured and and you forget all of the story that. Well, all of the things that um, you you know that aren't real, you you get taken into Pandora. You get taken on a journey. Jim is very creative and very precise in what he wants, and uh, I think it, it it turned out pretty pretty well. Many thanks to the team behind Avatar: The Way of Water. Next up is the Batman. In this discussion from our episode 116, we spoke with director Matt Reeves composer Michael Giacchino, and the nominees in the sound category, supervising sound editors William Files and Douglas Murray, both with their first Oscar nominations, and re-recording mixer Andy Nelson with his 23rd and 24th Oscar nominations this year. Uh, he'll appear twice on this episode. He has also won two Academy Awards in the past. Unfortunately, Stuart Wilson, who is the production sound mixer with his seventh Oscar nomination and one win was unable to join us for the recording. One of the first things that I noticed uh, right away was the treatment of, of the vocals. So first of all, you've got that first with the, with the Riddler, which I want to talk about. But also, you know, previously 
The treatment of the vocals for the Batman in previous iterations of this franchise has been the subject of some conversation, <laughs> uh, but you went in a completely different direction. Andy, I, I'm kind of curious about like, how did you approach the vocal mixing the vocals of, of the Batman and, and, and sort of making that tone and making it different from what yeah. we heard before? Well, because I come on, really, I'm the last to come on the, on the creative process here, which has an advantage in the sense that I come in with no history, no, uh, you know, we tried this, we tried this. I come into it as a fresh eye and ear to something that's going to be the final mix of the movie. So when it, when it came to Robert's voice, for instance, I mean, that that's all just pure performance. I mean, it's, it's, it's very clear to me that he found a place in his voice, in his range, in his acting that he needed to be at. All I was going to do was protect that because the tendency often with, with the big soundtracks, of course, is that they get layered bigger and bigger and bigger. And suddenly, you know, I have to be the kind of keeper at the end to say, hang on a minute, I don't think we can hear him very clearly anymore because, you know, everyone's got so used to the dialogue and, the, and you know, you start to hear the words in your head and you don't necessarily uh, pay attention to the fact that we've, we have to make them as clear as possible. So I think my job in that sense was just to protect his performance to be honest with you. Yeah, I mean, you would say, I don't know what he's saying there. <laughs> I would say, which I said many times, the first time I watched the movie through, I was like, this is fantastic, but we have to make sure we understand what's being said because it's just, that's, I'm the fresh person to the mix. And a cut, when we were looking at it, Andy was saying there's some places where it gets really big. And so we were like, we gotta find a way performance-wise to get more projection because I love the intimacy of him being really quiet but Andy was absolutely right you couldn't there were some places especially by the end when your music is enormous in the right way which is he's finally going to show up the whole thing that Michael's music does at the beginning is it's teasing you it's building slowly 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 and we're playing out all these shots and then finally at the end you're going oh my god is he going to come out is he going to come out of the shadows and he doesn't come out of the shadows yet and it's really big but at that point we're like well how can we do this so because of what Andy said I went back to Rob I said we have to find a way to let this build, to let it come through. And, and, and so that was, yeah. And I hated having to, you know, I always want to protect the original recordings as much as I can. But in this instance, I, I was desperate that we went back and tried at least, knowing that maybe it wouldn't work and we would have to use some of the originals. But in the end, I think we ended up with a bit of a combo. A both, yeah. Uh, and it worked great. So. Uh, what an amazing challenge for an actor doing a performance that's as intimate as Rob's is to then go back and then try to make adjustments like that in the ADR stage, probably what, a year after after yeah, photography? Yeah. At least, no, yeah, yeah, whatever it was, yeah. Yeah, yeah the, voice, the voiceover for that, uh, which is what we were talking about, is uh, there is that sort of crescendo of the music going on mm -hmm. throughout that whole sequence, which is, in my mind, one of the most interesting sequences in the movie. It was actually probably the hardest sequence other than the uh, Batmobile hard. chase Absolutely. to mix. Very yeah. hard to mix. Really and the last and I want to hear about the sound design of the Batmobile. <laughs> that was such a thrilling, satisfying moment. It, when well, that... largely because of the way Matt constructed the scene. And of course, we hear it before we see it. <clears throat> That's so... right. That's exactly what I mean. Yeah, it's so fun. I mean, it's literally hiding in the shadows, right? And the way Matt described the Batmobile was that he's using it to scare them. I mean, a lot of a lot of Batman, when he's in the suit, it's designed to be a threat. He's, you know, he's almost just trying to scare everybody even more than he is trying to kick their ass. Whoa! So the Batmobile is not only designed to go fast, it's also designed to look and sound aggressive and intimidating. And so I, I was, you know, sort of like Michael thinking about trying to, okay, if I had built that car and I wanted it to do this, how would I make it sound, right? Because of course you can tune an engine to sound any kind of different way. Um, and so the first element I came up with was the whine, the, the, the sort kind of, of high turbine, pitched, high pitch thing. Yeah. And the, the temptation with that is to just use like a, like a helicopter turbine or some other kind of mechanical turbine that has that kind of thing. But I, I wanted it to sound weirder than that, <laughs> you know, for lack of a better term. Um, and so I was, tr I was thinking, well, how can I make this out of something more like a shriek or more like something that was more primal? Like animalistic almost. Yeah, exactly. Right, yeah. And, 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 and so often when I'm, when I'm looking for sounds like that, I'll just start looking through my library and typing in words that have emotions like scary or shriek or 
panic or, you know, whatever it is. And I started assembling some sounds that I thought, oh, that's interesting, that's interesting. And I found this bottle rocket sound. It was just like, it was literally like a oh, woo. That's what like it that's is. that's it. It was like a one like a one second sound. <laughs> that thing? Like, yeah. Pew! Yeah, you know, yeah. That's yeah. it. <laughs> and, I, and it was like kind of distorted. It was like a little overmodulated. And there was something about it that had this really raw sound to it, but it was like literally one second. I was like, well, that's so cool, but that's eh, not gonna work. And I kept, you know, looking for other things and I was trying stuff and I kept going back to this bottle rock and I think oh, okay, what how could I make that into a 30 second sound because that's what it needed to be really for that whole wind up and so I started looking into some interesting processing and that you know tried running it through long reverbs and that sort of thing which is kind of kind of useful but it doesn't it, it loses its character it just turns into like a sound and echo basically right so I found this thing there was this like a few years ago somebody on YouTube posted this thing that was a Justin Bieber song slowed down 800 oh percent and it God. turns into something that sounds like Sigur Rose or something really beautiful and like haunting and I was like well maybe there's something to that let me fi figure out what was that software and it turns out it's this, this algorithm called Paul stretch and it's like you know command line kind of thing and you can basically it somehow breaks it up into little samples and then stretches them out individually and layers them. And I don't even, I don't even know how it works, but basically you can slow a sound down by like, you know, a hundred X, right? And it turns into this crazy version of itself. And so what I did was I, I made some, di some different length versions of, of the sound. And then I stretched, you know, just a little bit and then a little bit more and then a little bit more and then a hell of a lot more. And then I layered all those so that you still had the original, the initial kind of pop of it at the beginning and then it turned into this kind of like builder riser thing and then I of course I took that and I and I gave it even more of kind of a, a rise to it so it was functioning musically you know as a riser because Michael in his way that's always so amazing every time there's a moment that a lot of other composers would just completely you know cr like there's a big explosion and there's a giant you know <laughs> brass riff right, right over it but he always builds to it to the moment and then holds for a second and then comes back in right and when I you want the door to. open. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and it's something we've talked about this a million times, but it's, it's always such a joy when it's you're working so with Michael and you get to one of those moments in the score and you go, he understands how this functions. <laughs> you know, this is so great. Because in a lot of ways, I think uh, Michael thinks like a director, which is, you know, we're, we're all always trying to put our director hats on and think, how should this function cinematically? But, um, you know, it's not always the case. So anyway, that was one of those things where I knew it needed to function musically because it was it needed to carry that moment. Um, so that's why I wanted to have that kind of riser thing to it. So that was the that was the did main. Did you do all that work for the teaser trailer? I did. Yeah, yeah, I did. Well, right. luckily it was in the middle of pandemic, so I just yeah, that was uh, like a year I ago. I could just stay up all night doing. I had nothing else I mean, to do. It was more, well, than, more than a year ago. Yeah. It was a year and a half ago. So yeah, funny. it's the greatest thing in the world. It, that yeah, the greatest it, thing it is. In the world. Right. It's yeah. Great. Yeah. It is. It is just. I like, know. I just my wife just saw the movie. We just had a little had a little screening, and literally when that moment happens, where the car goes, boo, she yeah. went, she went like this. It was like, and you could just feel like everyone will instinctively know. Oh, that's, like, and that's the feeling I wanted was that feeling of like a bottle rocket just went off next to you. Yes, you know, it's yeah. like because the penguin is he's about to do something real bad. The great thing about Atmos for me, it takes what is normally sort of a boxing ring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where everyone is fighting for their space, mm -hmm. you know, and it, it expands that and it gives yeah. room for everyone to do what you need to do. So you don't always have to that pull back sound effects as much as you normally would or pull back music as much mm -hmm. to make room for because you can put these things in places where everything can live together yeah. in harmony. Yeah, which I is, mean, like the chase scene's a great example yeah. of that. Like, you know, which the, the motorcycle chase scene well, no, or, the, or, the, or the big, the Batmobile the big, chase the big, scene. Yeah. The big chase scene. Um, you know, there's moments in that where you're, you're strafing by these semi trucks and they're in the foreground and the cars in the background, un, you know, kind of see it going under the, t the tires. And that's the kind of thing where I can take those, I can take the semis that are like in the, you know, foreground, and I can make them run through the middle of the room yeah. while the music and the Batmobile are still on the front of the screen, yep. right? And so you can create this sort of diorama of sound. And, you know, obviously you can still do that in 5.1, but being able to do it in multiple planes, yeah. it there, really well, does well, add well, a lot that, to that the sequence. Is. Really, yeah. the Atmos pays off so importantly in that sequence, mm -hmm. especially as it, things get more and more complicated yeah. as we approach the ending and the giant crash, yeah. uh, the, the, all the details of the pallets falling off the truck and you know everything mm -hmm. that is happening 
it's so complicated and so hard to understand what's happening that the sound being precisely placed, right. which yeah. you can do with Atmos in a way that you can't otherwise, uh, really helped clarify. Yeah, just even the geography. Yeah, exactly. Like where I mean, is something? And, and if that's help, if you're getting that help, it makes it so much easier to enjoy the, the scene. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, if you hear a lot of stuff going on and you can't quite figure out what's happening, it's kind of like not hearing a line of dialogue clearly. Right. You know, it's kind of takes you out of the movie. Dolby Atmos, I mean, it works phenomenally for loud stuff, obviously, but it works really well for quiet. Yeah. Because suddenly you can really uh, get yeah. the detail of where the geography is. Yeah. And for me, musically, what I what I always try and do is I pull it wider than the screen. Wh whenever I'm mixing music in Dolby Atmos, I always go a little wider. It becomes the sound becomes more like Cinemascope, because I actually use the out outer speakers that are on in the corners of the room. I actually do a triangle with that sound and take the screen speaker off into that corner. And you don't really notice it. It's quite subtle, but it, it sort of opens up the screen and suddenly it allows a lot more space for sound effects particularly. But, but it immerses you literally in the music because it becomes around you, not to, so much to the back, but definitely to the sides and the front in a way that no other sound system can do. Many thanks to the team behind the Batman. Next up is Elvis. In this discussion, which we recorded exclusively for today's episode, we spoke with each of the nominees in the best sound category. First up, we have production sound mixer David Lee with his third Academy Award nomination, and he's already won once in the past. Re-recording mixer, sound designer, and supervising sound editor Wayne Pashley with his first Oscar nomination. Re-recording mixer Michael Keller also with his first Oscar nomination. And then there's Andy Nelson again, celebrating his other Academy Award nomination this year to go along with two previous wins. All right, so let's get going. First of all, gentlemen, congratulations on your Academy Award nomination for Elvis, well-deserved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, uh, thank you for coming on to the, to the Dolby podcast. Um, you know, we talk a lot on this show about the first 10 minutes of the movie and the what the filmmaker is doing to kind of set the rules of the road and explain the the cinematic language that they're going to be using to tell this particular story and i think it's fair to say that elvis has a pretty explosive uh first 10 minutes it's leaping through time it's uh, blending elvis songs with contemporary pop songs I, I i even think at one point like you launch the starship enterprise in that first 10 minutes or so of the film and it really does set the tone for the storytelling style of the rest of the film, uh, which I think I've, I've heard you guys describe as always exciting all the time. But of course, that's a big challenge from a, a sound perspective. So I'm curious, and I'm just gonna throw it out to the team, whoever wants to jump in and address it, how you work together to accomplish that goal to match the visuals, but obviously you can't just create a wall of sound for two plus hours because you'll just, you know, you'll wear the audience down. So uh, I'm curious how you how you face the challenge of matching the visual style, but not, you know, making sure that the audience, you can take them on the journey with you. Just in uh, uh, Baz Luhrmann's approach to, I think it's important to say that um, he's a very iterative filmmaker. So uh, yes, there's a plan during the shoot, it is set up as as what it will be now obviously for the first 10 minutes the big deal was the musical infrastructure number one so that was pretty well set in stone particularly come uh of, of fly away so the sequence then when we go to tupelo and to the shake rag into the pentecostal into the hayride so that was sort of a grounding sort of sort of area that we knew about earlier than that when it was about the Colonel, starting in the 1990s, uh, when he has the um, has the stroke, the heart attack, um, and and how we're going to introduce basically the villain of the story. So our you know antagonist is is got to be set up for people that don't actually know much about Colonel Tom Parker. There's a lot of story there, a lot of story with um, with him. And then, of course, the, the the joining up. So that 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 whole Faustian pact between Elvis Presley and Colonel Tom Parker had to get there quick. With the iterative style of Baz, I can tell you now that that opening <laughs> went through many many versions, 
uh, down to when, when when he goes into the fever dream, the 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 morphine trip, if you like, when he's in the hospital, that went through so many different uh, um, styles and things. And to to give you an example, um, <clears throat> the editors uh, Matt Villa and um, John O'Redman uh, were given a little video that Baz did on his phone, and he drew some very rudimentary pictures of how the colonel should go through his morphine trip. They included elephants, uh, tightrope walking, which he shot, by the way, all this sort of stuff. We even in ADR shot um, Tom Hanks doing this rap in the, he was in a snow globe, you know, with all the snow inside. And then he goes into the Hall of Mirrors. It was absolutely sensational. <laughs> but of course, what happens is, oh, but by the way, that, that little video had these rudimentary drawings. And when it got to the bit where it was the peak of the fever dream, he just got all these pencils and it was filmed and just dropped them on a piece of paper and said, do that to the editors. So it was like, <laughs> that's the sort of uh, uh, post dealings that you're dealing with. So that went through a lot of uh, um, iterations into the, into the comic book, which was um, again, a, uh, a post idea that came from Elvis's love of comics and um, Catherine Martin and her team in the, in, the, in the graphics department came up with the idea to help us get through to Tupelo. Then we were kind of good for the Pentecostal shake rag into the hayride, which then got us into Beale Street, which then it kicked off again with, um, with Hound Dog, uh, with, with um, Shonka singing, and then into, into Doja. So... Yes, it was crazy, but of course, with that iterative style, it was, it was with the, we did four audience previews. Um, so we did f four to five tent mixes, some studio, some uh, audience. And it was a really, it was very clear that we had to get to Elvis quicker for the audience because the Colonel was, uh, who is this guy? And he was such a mystery. And, and, and really the Colonel remains a mystery to so many people. So, um, so that's, that's what we really do. So between editorial, music department, obviously Baz, each time we do a temp, we're, we're, we're very, uh, we're working it, we're changing it, we're dropping things, we're adding new. And it, it honestly, it doesn't stop even to, to the very end of the final mix where I was amazed, Andy, when we were doing the shake rag bit in Tupelo and we had uh, these wonderful foot stomps uh, that the Foley guys did um, for, for, um, for all that bit. And, and, and Baz then took those feet and put them in the music track. So you're now getting this heavy bass drop. So it never stopped. Listen, Wayne, that's, you've explained it incredibly well because the, the, the interesting thing is you've got the geography, the history, of the sequence and and to see it evolve we come on of course when it's and it's in its final form i mean there was a little picture work but basically it's it's sort of cut so what we do what michael and i did was of course respond to that sequence and um, what what i was able to bring to it was a little bit of memory of uh, moulin rouge which is the first time i worked with baz and his desire to make pe the audience what he called sign the contract of like I'm going to present something to you that's going to challenge you, and uh, but but you know it's going to be worth it because you're going to get something from it. And I, as soon as I saw this movie for the first time, I thought, oh boy, here we go, which being challenged in in an incredible Baz way, and that's exactly what it was. So yes, for us, it was about finding that weave, finding the clarity. You're dealing with. Um, Tom Hanks's character, uh, it, Colonel Tom, with, with, with his accent, plus a, a, a voiceover at times, which is always a little harder when they're not on screen, plus an older and younger version of the Colonel at times. So, I mean, talk about a mashup. Uh, and then, of course, as you said, we've got Doja Cat going, we've got uh, you know Stevie Nicks. We're weaving stuff all over the place musically. I mean, what I love is Baz's idea that music is, is timeless. You know, it doesn't matter that they're all related to each other musically in, in, in old and new. And, and I think that was um, our goal was to get this sort of dynamic sense, but never losing clarity. That was always our kind of number one thing. Well, I, I think actually that's great, Andy, because that was one of the uh, heavy directives when we first started into Post was 
um, Baz was very clear to, to all departments, but particularly to sound design and music, that it had to be all in harmony and all as a singular vision and, and, and be very, very careful, particularly of crowd fatigue. So yeah. the crowds were so massive and obviously thematically so very, very important for Elvis's character because it's, you know, our love for him and his in return, which ultimately kills him. So as a theme, the crowds were really, really uh, tricky, you know, yes. because because the temptation is to just like excitement, 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 but you had to find those, that, that kind of mosaic weave to, 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 to fill it. And then that it goes to effects as well. When you throw in the a Starship Enterprise and the whirling cameras around the international and all those things, it's like, you know, those things, as you can imagine, from the visual effects point of view, they were continually coming in as well, you know, and it's like, oh, wow. So, yeah, OK. <laughs> yeah. Well, you guys have mapped out quite a lot for us to talk about, and I have a lot of questions to dive into, um, <clears throat> you know, what, what you guys did. But, I, you know, Andy, you brought up Tom Hanks uh, and, and, you know, obviously he made a, a very bold choice to go with this Dutch accent as Colonel Tom Parker. Uh, so, David, I would love to hear, I mean, did that performance create issues for you in the capture on the set? And then, Andy, one of the things that I just found remarkable about the film was that I never lost a syllable of dialogue. The clarity was uh, fantastic and amazing. And so kudos to you guys for that. But let's start, David, on the set and capturing uh, capturing that 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 pretty crazy accent. And of course, obviously, um, uh, you know, uh, Tom Hanks was under a lot of prosthetics and a, and a pretty pretty big costume as well. Look, there's always going to be clothing noise, no matter uh, what what you come up against. So his fat suit was always a bit of a problem, um, given the limited time we get to apply the microphones. But there's always the boom on the close up, and um, you know we. Didn't stress too much, although in the background you're always stressing. Um, early days of the, his days on set, Wayne and I were chatting about the articulation. It was of great, great concern. But uh, we forged on. We, you know, that's the way it was. So no real problems, just the one or two odd days or odd scenes where the uh, lav was problematic, but um, you're always going to get that sort of thing. But pretty much standard moving forward, recording dialogue on set. Yeah, I'll add to that. Uh, through the dialogue edit and um, the and the picture edit, um, we had Matt Villa, one of the editors here in Sydney, uh, where Jono Redman was up in Queensland during the shoot. During the shoot, and when uh, Matt kept calling me in to assess and and. I've got to say it was a little bit worrying because at times, well, you had the accent issues, which obviously Tom had done an enormous amount of preparation for and had researched and researched. And aside from that, you know, just in, in a Baz world of opera and, and you know, um, sort of selling your, selling your villain in such a way, and, and, and the fact that he really, it was Colonel Tom felt that he was a Dutch mentalist. You know, he could get anything from you simply by con confounding you and, and, you know, discombobulating your, um, your, <laughs> you know, financier, you know. So, like, I mean, people gave him money just to get him the hell away from, from him, you know. So, so, you know, I think that, I think that he, he, you know, Tom worked very hard. And of course, when you apply five hours of makeup, was it David, whatever it was, five hours every day, um, it was a little worrying with the clarity. Yeah. And, um, in the end, you know, with, uh, with wonderful tools that are available these days, you know, um, with RX and all those things and, you know, the wonderful EQs, it really, it really sort of saved us. But it did go through, he, he, his thing went through a bit of a transition too, because you had the 90s when he, when he had the, um, the heart attack. And then you had, um, you know, uh, his, his, you know, unreliable narrator stuff that Andy was talking about with the VO. He had to sound older, you know, and, 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 and basically how long is that story that he's telling? Is it just actually half an hour before he dies or is it? 
whatever. So so he had to work quite hard on that VO to give him age, you know, as opposed to in the film where he was much younger and more vital. So yeah, it was it was a it was a tough one, it, you know. And Tom and Tom worked really really hard, I have to say. And I know people have put the boot into his kind of crazy performance, but I actually think. It is one of the most memorable performances that will go down in this this decade. I think we spent longer, just to answer your question fully, Glenn, we probably spent longer on lines of dialogue from him than anything else in the movie. I mean, Wayne and I would sit there and we'd study every syllable because we knew that... Uh, I'm so glad to hear you say you understood it all completely because there were times when we were scratching our heads going, "Is this? can we do better? Can we do more? Is there a little take? Is there a tea we can steal from that? You know, there were just tiny things that you do. It wasn't anything about Tom's performance. It was just to gain that clarity. I'd like to pivot for a second and talk about Austin Butler uh, and his extraordinary performance. Um, and he's getting a lot of attention for the Elvis voice, rightly so, which I think is uh, is uh, an amazing bit of 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 actor craft on his part. So, but but I, I understand that Austin uh, did a fair amount of the singing. Um, himself, especially uh, in the 1950s and 60s um, sequences. I, I would love to hear you guys just kind of break that down and talk to us about. Um, so, w was there were all of those tracks pre recorded with Austin? Was he singing back to pre records on the set? Was there live singing? Was there a blend? Is any, and, and at some point, do we start hearing Elvis's real voice? And how did you kind of blend all of this together because it just sounds remarkably cohesive and I don't know which I'm hearing as I go through. Well, we go back to before we started shooting, I believe in June um, in 2019, um, Austin was not a natural singer. Elliot Wheeler, our musical director, producer, taught him how to sing. I don't know whether there's other people involved as well, but that was an incredible feat. And to jump ahead, um, yes, on the, on the playback tracks, we'd have Elvis, we'd have a pre-record of Austin and then Austin Live. And um, it's a story I've repeated several times. One side of my headphones was Elvis. The other side was uh, Austin. And there they were, a, a mirror or, you know, just so wonderfully the same, nuanced. Totally nuanced. So, yeah, no, amazing piece of craft, Austin, his work. And he still seems to be got that Elvis, Elvis voice at the moment, doesn't he? <laughs> he stayed in character apparently over our, our, um, over our COVID break, which is like three months, I think, from March. Um, he stayed in character. He stayed in Australia and stayed in character. By the time it came to me, the decision really had been made with Baz and music and everybody that the switchover point would be at the 68 comeback special. Because clearly, the, the, the truth is, Austin could have sung the whole movie and did sing the whole movie. But, you know, it's an Elvis movie. You're going to want to hear Elvis. So the decision was to switch over at that 68 comeback special, which is a great place to switch. But it was quite challenging because the uh, material we were dealing with was was from the transmission. It was actually a mono track. So there was a lot of enhancement work that had to be done musically. And then there was a lot of work with various toys, technology to try and pull Elvis's vocal out away from the, the music and away from the crowd. The crowd were, were pretty heavy on that track as well. So I think it was a question of, okay, now we've, we've, we've got this point in the movie, we need to go into, into the real track, but um, we don't want it to take a sonic, you know, backward step. I just want to make sure that I, 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 I'm, I'm clear and I understand. So that 68 comeback concert, you, you had one mono audio element with everything tied, vocals, yes. Yes. Uh, instrumentation, crowds. Correct. And from that, as I say, we had to try and pull out the vocal as best you can and then recreate all the all the other stuff to go with it, which is exactly what you heard in the movie. So from that point on, we stay with Elvis. And of course, the tracks got better as we get to Vegas. We had multi-tracks and it was less enhancement that was needed. But um, but that particular switchover was, was probably the single most challenging thing that I had to deal with during the mix was to try and make that as, as alive and as fresh as it could be and yet still retain all that uh, vintage quality. But yeah, we played a while with that, Wayne, didn't we, and Michael? 
how long did you spend on that song? Well, I sent everybody home at, at least one or two nights so that I could try and do something without a crowd around me. <laughs> I remember Libby, um, uh, my uh, yeah, co and um, partner, we, we were at the mix there. And when you said, how about I just stay for a few hours and you guys go, and it was about seven o'clock at night, we just went, you beauty. And we went to Musso and Frank and just went, see ya. <laughs> I think I did it again after that, though. <laughs> well, you did too. And yeah, that's right. Baz came back in. See, the beautiful thing was is that we, because we had Austin as well, we not only had what David recorded, we also had Austin's ADR fillers. So when he came in, we all had the we had a mic kit that went around um, with Austin for any post recording. So the same microphones we used from Elvis's original, Austin on the day, and now into post. So the Shaw 55 um, was for the 50s, the Altec 195A was the 60s, and the Electro Voice uh, RE15 was for the 70s. So that kit went around. Austin saw the final cut of the musical performances. Sometimes it wasn't the final cut. And any time that Elvis went off mic uh, in the original, Austin filled it. And then, and that included all the breaths and vocals, all the all all, all the energy and all the, the the creating the reality on top of what Andy had, you know. So yeah, it was a it was a full 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 deal. I mean, you had a lot of stuff with the crowds, Mike, during that, didn't you? As well to try and blend in. Oh yeah, especially especially in that scene, it was difficult because you already owned so much crowd in your track, and we couldn't get rid of it. That that was one of the hardest one to somehow create an atmos, you know, immersive environment. And then, and then you could barely add anything to it. Otherwise you would destroy the vocal again. That was much easier later or the, the opening of the, of the movie was easier. And then also once he gets to Vegas, that's where we could shine in all department because we had all the separation in the world and, and, and that was fantastic. Andy, I want to talk with you about the music uh, for a moment. There's a lot of bold choices that Baz makes in this film to combine Elvis's you know, uh, historical uh, tracks with pop, hip hop, you know, the, the, the music is just a kind of a wonderful uh, uh, grouping of all different kinds of, of genres, but it's still, you know, and, and you also have an amazing score by Elliot Wheeler, but it still feels very cohesive and it all makes sense. All these disparate elements sitting together. So, can you talk a little bit about blending the music and making making that cohesive treatment? As David mentioned, Elliot Wheeler and Jameson Shaw, who were really the two key people on the stage with me, both as producers, music producers, and composer. Um, you know, obviously, this stuff doesn't just happen; it's all planned as carefully as can be planned. Although Baz will will constantly think of different changes and things, and that's it. I described Baz last night to the audience at this Q&A as a uh, creative tornado that comes in and f throws ideas at you. And uh, everybody laughed, of course, but it's kind of true, you know. So, so just because you've got everything set doesn't mean that's the way it's going to be because Baz will see it and immediately have a new thought. Um, but yes, the blending, I mean, uh, you know, again, I refer back to Moulin Rouge because this is kind of what we did, you know, with, with that. And this is, this is much more complex in that sense. But, um, I think that's, that's, as I said earlier, that's that timeless nature of music. I think he wanted to feel that it was a, you know, it, it didn't matter what era we were listening to music from. It was all relative. It was all, um, part of the legacy of, of, of Elvis in the sense, you know. Um, so, uh, you know, again, you're just creating, first of all, I mix in a traditional style on a, on a console. So we would, I would often take long runs at musical sequences. It wouldn't be done frame by frame in any sense because it's just not my style. And, um, and I just feel it from, from what I'm watching most of the time. And, um, you know, I remember one point I did something bad, said to me, what did you just do? And I said, I have no clue because there was nothing surgical about what I do as, as Wayne and Michael know, it's, it's kind of just fluid as, as it feels. So, um, and by the way, he liked it. He didn't say do it again. He said it was good, but, but my point is that it, it that a lot of what I do because of that style is, is sort of intuitive to that moment, you know, and reactive to the screen. I'm always just watching the screen. 
and um, but but yeah, a lot of those blends obviously were pre planned. It was just a question of how we executed it. And I've always got my ear on the dialogue, of course, to make sure we're understanding everything as, as best we can. So with our audience, we've been talking um, with the nominated teams uh, about the Bake Off. Uh, and so I, I know that for the, when you guys uh, made the short list and you presented a 10 minute reel uh, to the sound branch at the Academy for the, for the Bake Off. I, I know that you featured the sequence in the film, uh, with the, the Rustwood Park concert, uh, in 1956. And, and that's a, that's a specific sequence where, um, Elvis has been getting into a bit of trouble, uh, for his, his gyrating hips, uh, and being too expressive a performer. And so, um, he goes into this concert. It's intercut with a segregationist rally that's happening at the same time. Uh, but of course the big, the big reveal is that Elvis is irrepressible and he cannot be contained. And so once he gets going with the performance, he cuts loose and the crowd goes insane and the police come in and chaos happens. So uh, I would love to hear from you guys. Why did you select that particular sequence? And why did you feel like that sequence kind of uh, featured the variety of work that went into the track? Yeah, we, it's funny that you, that you asked that because we were going back and forth. It was a choice between either Suspicious Minds in Vegas, which is a very polished rock and track, right? Very clear and clean and bassy and Atmos shines all the way. And it's, it's, it's phenomenal. And then, but the, the extreme opposite is then Russwood where, um, Baz would call it dirty corners where, you know, it would just, something would just pop at you and being extremely stylized. So it's the exact opposite of what Vegas does. And so we're debating and going back and forth and, you know, and then there's the opening of the movie, which is also 10 minutes of extremely stylized storytelling where everything just flies at you. And the, and the biggest challenge was the clarity, right? I mean, there's so much coming at you that if you sound design every single whoosh and camera flick, uh, it, it'll be s stimulus overload. You, you just can't grasp it all. So we had to constantly go back. That first 10 minutes didn't feature any of its performance. Yeah. And you got to, exactly. You got to uh, see the performance and, and we always have to sit back and, and say, okay, now we're an audience member. We're not mixers and we're not movie makers in that sense. You just need to sit back, take it in and, and, and see if you follow the right elements, you know, because you can, I mean, with bass, there's a bazillion different things you can highlight and at, at the end it's going to be a mess so you got to sit back and 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 scale things back to really tell the 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 audience what to focus on and and rustwood is just extremely stylized where you come in gentle with offstage dialogue right from the politicians and then you interweave it with crowd and then the musical dancers being in time to the score i mean there's so much amazing weaving going on in that scene and then to the to the bold punk Right where he performs, and then and then you end very gentle again, and you drift out into the regular mood of the movie. I also just to add to that, I think the reason we also chose it was it was a really good representation of everyone's de departments within the um, within the sonic architecture, because it had David's wonderful recording of Austin singing and talking. Uh, uh, you had um, kind of really cool sound design moments of of where the FBI, you know, uh, come in. By the way, that FBI material of those cameras and things like that, that was, again, a, a, a quite a late post pickup shoot where, where, you know, we had the segregation line, we had the dances all happening and, and that explosion of, of um, you know, the political sort of issues of the time. And then, of course, you had the actual fear of Elvis being thrown in jail. So therefore, the, the, the government organizations were bought in late, which was great because it gave us that new energy to do the dirty corners, just like Michael said. And I just thought it was a really good representation and um, with, with mixing the music, uh, recording and, and sound design and also crowds. That was a perfect example of where when he enters that stadium with, I think I worked out, I think Russwood can hold 15 or 20,000 at the time, people, a very, it was very tempting to oversell the, you know, the Elvis phenomena. But I, th I think, you know, Baz was right, you know, like the containing 
of that uh, of that sort of you know overload for an audience. Um, I thought it was a great representation of crowd, and of course we got the crowds to sing along with you know um, uh, uh, you know a green eyed mountain jack. The whole crowds were singing. And, you know that was that was all post done with Barbara Harris's wonderful team and and they did all the spot crowds and things like that. But um, yeah, so that's why we showed it. Well, uh, I know we're coming to the end of our time. I just want to wrap up by asking you, uh, I, this was a stunning mix in Dolby Atmos. And Michael, you've talked about using Atmos a little bit. I, I'd love uh, to hear your perspective on on how Atmos helped you unlock the storytelling possibilities in all this. Well, I think, let me just start by saying that this was native Dolby Atmos from the word go. Uh, basically, all the pre-dubs that we were doing here in Sydney and all that stuff, it was, it was again, iterative to each, each edit. We stayed in Atmos the whole way. Um, when it came to um, delivery of, of um, tent mixes and things, it's, they started out being just stereo, um, you know, the first couple. And then it was really disappointing to me that with such, with these tracks and the music, that if you're going to do a tent mix for an audience preview, it's got to be at least 5.1. So, so what was happening was when you're in an editorial sense, it's very difficult for the editors and the assistant editors, picture wise, to handle um, to handle those tracks when Baz will not stop cutting. It, you know, it's just going to be the changes are just too extreme. So eventually we did a version for Baz of the film in 5.1 that he could watch in his theatreette in, um, in Queensland because we were COVID split um, due to lockdowns and things. I was in Sydney. He was in, up there near Brisbane at the Gold Coast. And, um, and once he heard the 5.1, that kind of set the, the rules for the next, the, the subsequent temps for an audience previews that it has to be 5.1 for that, for that sort of energy and to feel like you're watching Elvis Presley for the first time. So crowd-wise, incredibly important with Dolby Atmos because you could move it and you could seamlessly sort of like keep it intact, as well as the height of the auditoriums, you know, to be able to use those height speakers for reverbs and all that stuff. Uh, the other thing was the transitions. Because it's a quite a montage-heavy narrative and the visual effects were coming in and the wipes and all that carry on, um, the transitions for the sound design and the effects were fantastic because what you could do was use the objects, take all, put them in the objects, move it halfway up 50% uh, between the sidewalls and the roof, and everything was flying at, at screen height. So not above you, not you know just sitting down here, but, but it was everywhere. So that really helped the transitions. And one of the things was with transitions was you know, uh, the sonic architecture of it all, you know, Baz kept saying, look, try and find transitions that are unexpected. And that included all our voices that were going on in the Atmos sort of arena. So basically that was how it was started in Dolby Atmos. I frankly would never go back to, to even, even a short film, anything. Everything is in Dolby Atmos from the, from the ground. Yeah, to me, to me, it's the, the base extension in the surrounds. That's, that's the ticket for me because... Normally, especially with transitions where there's low end wishes and whatnot, once you go overhead, you lose some, you know, the balls disappear. <laughs> and uh, and with Dolby Atmos, that is not the case. So it, it keeps the energy up and you don't feel a, a, a dip in, you know, low end or, or low level, which is brilliant. I mean, that's what I rely on most. I just like to call out to uh, my team, really. You know, when you're on a Baz Luhrmann picture, uh, if you don't have that trust and that love for your team, yeah, you know, which I've been working with some of them for over 30 years, you know, um, Fabian San Giorgio, uh, my effects soup and, um, and Darren Pascal dialogue soup without, and, and everybody else, you know, you can't, you can't do it without them and their support. Now I honestly believe at the end of the day, if the team and the love of the project uh, and the, the energy and the immersiveness of everyone's sort of um, feel for the job, it ends up on the screen. So, you know, I just want a bit of a shout out to those guys that really dug deep and, um, and just loved Elvis. Gentlemen, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the Dolby podcast and talk about Elvis. Congratulations on a very well-deserved Academy Award nomination for Best thank Sound. You. And uh, good luck in a few weeks at the Dolby Theatre. 
uh, Andy, Michael, Wayne, David, thanks so thanks. much for joining us. Thank you. Right. Thanks. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Many thanks to the team behind Elvis. And last, but certainly not least, we have Top Gun Maverick. In this discussion from episode 133, we spoke with director Joseph Kaczynski, supervising sound editor Bjorn Schroeder, and the nominees in the best sound category, supervising sound editor James Mather with his second Oscar nomination, supervising sound editor Al Nelson with his first Academy Award nomination, re-recording mixer Chris Burden with his second Oscar nomination, and re-recording mixer Mark Taylor with his fifth Oscar nomination to go along with one previous win. Unfortunately, production sound mixer Mark Weingarten with his fifth Oscar nomination wasn't available to join us when we made this recording. It was a great catching up with uh, with Mark Weingarten after he was done with the shoot. And I know that he had a lot of challenges in the beginning just to get those recorders into the cockpit because he had to go through a lot of different steps to ensure the safety. Um, they had to make sure that they could still use the ejector seat just in case of an emergency. So like this little recorder had to eject with them. You know, they had to be separate from the cameras. I think it was really important to to Joe and Tom and everyone in the crew uh, that they could uh, kind of keep it simple, that they could basically trigger the recording, you know, before they took off um, and and do all the recordings. The uh, And I also knew uh, once they came back and you guys checked all the rushes that uh, Joe and you guys all just absolutely loved that sound that Mark created. And that was kind of like our, our guiding kind of position to make sure that we recaptured, as Joe mentioned, we did uh, shoot quite a bit of ADR afterwards, but to just kind of keep that intensity. And we did like, you know, little tricks, uh, kind of playing it futz back to the actors, uh, you know, Joe and even Tom were quite involved to get the actors back into the ADR studio and kind of relive that moment, which is quite difficult because it's such a nice, warm, cozy, inviting, warm atmosphere. And like, now you're trying to kind of pretend again that you're in that F-18 fighter jet kind of pulling multiple Gs. Um, but, um, I think we're very, very proud of how, um, you know, this all kind of came to sound just like Mark's recordings. And then when the final mix went to, uh, to Chris Burden, I think one of the nice things that I think was achieved was the, the sound was kind of established that it was like th that intensity, but I think even like in the dog fight, when they're training, I think uh, Chris did such a beautiful job of just backing off enough that you're still connected to the dialogues. I think the, the beauty of this mix really is that at the end, you never really feel like you're, you're disconnected from the dialogues, which is easy to do with that kind of intense, kind of, you know, heavily treated kind of um, distorted dialogue in the beginning. So I'm very, very proud of that fact. Joe, you mentioned how quiet is in there. One of the things I was grateful for <clears throat> was the fact that when they hit record, it, there was no stopping and starting take one, take two. It just recorded the whole thing. So one of the things we loved doing was just pouring through the production. And what I was looking for was anything that wasn't, you know, just general hum, looking for any communications from from the tower, uh, beeps, bitch and Betty, um, all of this stuff. And so there were all of these found treasures in the production that were either just references of what the pilots hear or actual usable material that we could plug in to make the inside of the cockpit realistic because in you know in reality that was uh, what what was happening in the jet so it was actually a, a blessing that we had all of that you know all those you know gigabytes and terabytes of extra media to pour through to start to add to the track to to add that complexity yeah, it was always to get back to that kind of that real sound. I think that was the mantra from the beginning of the uh, of post production. That Joe, you really wanted us to get back to that that feeling that we got from Mark's recording, and uh, I think hopefully we achieved that. The joy of the film is that it's it's so confident in in its characters and characterization. You can you uh, use the anchor point of the real sound in the helmets and the cockpits, and then emotionally on certain scenes we were able to just back off and and make sure you could hear the characters voices and it didn't ever feel like you weren't in there with them and we could do that throughout the film you know early on in the dark star there's actually quite a lot of distortion on tom's voice early on in maverick's voice and then it opens up when it, it just gets more emotional and and we could we could do that so confidently throughout the whole film because we just 
we were so lucky we had a story the whole thing we just believed it and we could kind of and it was great to do that you know when there's when there's the training run you can just get keep, keep the character of the voices because they all have great different voices up there and if you just over distort it you lose that so we had we had the anchor points that we knew the sound that had been recorded that's how we wanted to get as our core but we could move and just adjust right throughout the whole film yeah it was great chris the uh the the a uh, coyote passing out was such a great moment in the film where you kind of just kind of backed off. You kind of just really went into his head. I just absolutely love that, that sequence, how it came out in the end of the final mix. I'm so grateful that Joe and Tommy Harper and the production were, um, you know, eager to, to kick it off so early and, and give us that opportunity. Uh, th- yeah. As Joe says, the carrier is it's, it's an overwhelming, you know, dangerous, uh, and and remarkable scenario. You've got five thousand people on an island floating in the Atlantic, you know, and you've got everything happening all at once. Uh, and in this particular situation, um, it was the first time that F-18s and F-35s were actually launching together, which was really cool. This was something the Navy had never done before uh, from a carrier. Uh, on top of that, you've got Claudio and their team shooting these sequences so it was the 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 whole carrier was a buzz and yes the the uh, the main goal which we were uh, gratefully successful with was to just get as much material as possible uh definitely f-18s got f-35s there's all kinds of other sounds that you wouldn't imagine that are just uh fantastic and useful in both in their literal representation, but also as just sound design sweeteners, everything from the dry fire of the of the catapults to the uh, the cable room below deck where the jets are landing, and then these cables, you know, through uh, hydraulics tighten and loosen, and and all of these various tanks and purges and doors and winds and and oh the PA's are amazing, and you know the sounds when the boat turns around, so all these other things happening, and then. Uh, another wonderful um, part of this early expedition was all the R and D, and that was with interacting with the the women and the men there in the Navy, and in particular the pilots. You know, one of the things, you know, my I had actually been on a carrier uh, back uh, about ten or fifteen years before then, and I kind of had an idea, but. Um, I never really got to understand what it's like to be in the cockpit of a jet, of an F-18. Um, and this was an opportunity to really sit down with a lot of those pilots and other crew members and ask a lot of questions. And one of the great things was to just, we, we would at lunch or dinner sit with these pilots and their rule was, uh, it was always a round table and there's no limit to the number of people you can get at a round table. And so there's this camaraderie that you experience right away. And that's something that I think is reflected so well in the film. Al, I, I would love to hear you just address really quickly, like the, the, the technical aspect of getting field recordings in that kind of environment. Cause I, I've only like listened to the blue angels during fleet week in San Francisco, but I can say that's probably one of the loudest sounds I have ever heard in my entire life. And how do you actually get good recordings of something that has that much signal? Well, you bring Benny Burt. <laughs> um, we brought a lot of gear um, and a lot of what, you know, 30 dB pads, which are these things that take uh, the level and they, uh, they suppress it pre the preamp so that you're not hitting your recorder. And we recorded everything digitally. Um, one thing I knew this time that I had experienced last time in the carrier uh, when I went to the Nimitz back in 2003 was there's all of this radio technology and telemetry and all of these things that are going on that, are, you know, who knows what they're doing to our insides. But wherever, whenever you would point your microphone in particular directions, you'd get this crazy feedback and garbled noise. So we kind of tried to prepare for that. Uh, and then, yeah, the levels. And the one thing that um, that I think we were successful at, and, and, and kudos to Mark Taylor and, and Chris uh, and James and, and the UK team who, um, who did this final Atmos mix, but the one goal was that you wanted the track to feel like, to, to feel a jet the way a jet really feels 
uh, when you're that proximal to it. And it's, it's a, it hits you in the gut. It's just this intense level of low end and power. And so we used a lot of pads and a lot of gear to record lots of material. And the, um, the other thing you learn to do is you learn to embrace distortion. The jets are literally distorting the air. And so in the beginning I was going through and I was going, Oh gosh, I can't use this. It's, 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 it's clipping. And you, you start to realize, no, that's, that's the sound, you know, when they have something called um, there's, there's military power and then there's combat power. And that's when they actually use the afterburners. So you, these jets, these F-18s get on the deck and the, the, the barrier goes up and they just go in full thrust and then they hit the afterburners and it's just this wall of power. And, you know, that final scene before they launch off the carrier, that's, you know, that's both production, right, Chris? Uh, it has production in it, and it also has our sounds in it, and you know it's just this this massive wall. And the goal is to have the theater feel like the carrier, which I think they were very successful at reproducing. Yeah, Chris and Mark, I would love to hear about like what, what was that mixing process like for you? You guys were at Twickenham. Joe was listening remotely from Fox in LA, thousands of miles away. It's probably not the optimal. Uh, a way of mi uh, mixing and working with a director, but talk about the challenges of doing that and how you addressed it. Like we said, having Eddie there was amazing. Having Chris go through and do a pass of the music beforehand was also really helpful for me. And drilling in the mantra of, of uh, protecting the dialogue at all costs, which I think I did. Um, and then just having some fun with it. Sometimes we were allowed to go to 11. We were reined in, but... Um, you know, Eddie would say, well, let's give it a try. So we did. And, you know, we slowly temper it back down to where it should be. But it was, it was just good fun. You know, it was good fun. And, you know, just going through, you know, I can remember, like, I would go, I had a little cutting room off, off to the side, and I would go and sit and just listen to all the tracks in isolation whilst Chris was doing a music pass, learning what was there, really, and what kind of elements I could use when we got to things like the canyon run where um when tom told us to turn it down we did turn it down but we didn't turn everything down we kept we've got these lovely kind of distorted jet buys and and the movement of the cockpit and stuff which we could maintain to um to keep the presence of the jets without losing the interiors and then when we cut to the exteriors then i was allowed to have it as it were <laughs> quite quite amazingly too it's, it's, yeah. thank you. it's a great sequence it is it's my favorite sequence i mean the communication um from the get-go to sort of get, getting the phone call where I, I go downstairs having had the phone call from paramount thing saying i think i've just been asked to work on top gun and the excitement and then that was a period of time and i again i don't know exactly how long we just used that time through james and communicating with al and bjorn getting our schedule when we knew that we'd get a hold of the Pro Tools sessions. And then, because it is about, we've been, do, some of us have been doing this quite a long time and you have your own way of approaching it. And we had these pre-mixed sessions from Chris Boyd and Gary Summers that we had to just adapt to our way, but we did have a nice amount of time to just a few days here and a few days there, they're building up to our, the schedule to actually get in the theater. So we could, and um, Simon Chase and I would talk. We'd, we'd talk through getting getting a method for again the distortions and so on, and getting that into my template and so on. And I knew that Mark, in parallel, was looking at sessions, getting his bus structure, all the sort of technical stuff, lining it up, and feeling then we were going, we were going to be ready to go. Um, again, I had a l lovely few days, two or th three days. Eddie, Eddie, again, I, this is. This is referencing back to what Joe said that we we had this guiding shape in the Avid, and again when we spoke to Eddie, that would be again this this transitional point. We'd discuss that, and he'd say, "Just reference that. If he's not in the room, just reference it for shape." And it would be, you know, we'd we'd want to take it and burn that, you know, give it all what we're hearing there and, and use it. Um, and he's he just again I had the three days on the music and. It, it was a follow-on from something he he said many times over the years. 
you know, Mission Impossible, the, the bit I, I mixed, you know, make it the best Atmos mix musically you've ever done. We didn't go particularly gimmicky on this mix in terms of loads of um, extra excessive spinning things around that the the, the 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 surrounds and the overheads. I think we just again, I think it's because we appreciate we just knew the story. We knew what we wanted to approach was just so focused anyway. But I obviously enjoyed all of that on the music mix. And I told the story before. I was just sitting in the room at Twickenham doing music on my own and just hair standing up on the back of my neck, sequence after sequence. And just, you know, Cecile Tournesac, brilliant music editor, was in there taking the latest stuff from Lauren Valve and, and right back through all the Hans Zimmer and Faltermar stuff. And I was just kind of so privileged and felt I couldn't quite believe that this was this was I was being paid to do this um it, it was so so we had this transition and then we we kind of hit the ground running and um you know we'd have a few days we had the first few days before we saw um Tom and Chris turned up I feel I feel sad you know that that Joe's Joe was so far away and you had to just wait and there would just be this 24-hour turnaround and the notes would come back and it's and I, it, you know, I feel sorry. We were in there like pigs and shit, you know, the proverbial. But Joe would have to wait, and then we'd get the feedback. And I hope, I hope it was fun that you seeing what we did and hearing what we did. But you know, we were in the thick of it, and just hopefully sending it and, and getting the feedback. And we enjoyed getting the notes, and we were, we were confident that we could do them, and so on. But um, it's it was unusual that filmmakers were spread across the universe for us. Chris, I just want to say, like, I'm not sure if it's uh, a share with everyone, but uh, one of my favorite, and it's such a simple moment, and we we always get close to it, but the, uh, the musically, I thought the, when we have the dark star and we kind of go up in the sky and we see that, like, that wide shot and the dark star kind of s as screams across the, uh, uh, and with our planet below, and you have that beautiful transition to the music, that's probably my second favorite moment in the whole film. And it's just so beautifully mixed uh, with that with that final music cue that came in. So I absolutely loved that moment. He felt that one. He felt that he, one. We definitely, you, we definitely, you. we all felt that one. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> when you've got visuals like that, again, it was just such a joy because it just it felt natural, even though mixing can be difficult. And, you know, we had real moments of, 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 of like the opening sequence, just feeling it, Tom and Chris, just, just totally feeling that we'd, we were right in the ballpark there. We had the moments of, like James is referring to, the training sequence had a, a music cue that Tom came in and felt he couldn't hear any of the dialogue. And that was like... And then we changed the cue and Cecile went off. They, they recut the sequence a little bit to tighten and we had the who in there. And again, all these iconic moments in that track, which I remember as a kid and trying to play the organ bit on a synthesizer and there it is in front of me and I'm, it's cut so beautifully so quickly that you just have Roger Daltrey just being the backdrop and then all of dialogues working and it's like thank you very much we'll go with that so you know but there were moments when and but they every everything worked everything worked with a rhythm the cut the shots the cut the sound the music everything ended up working I can't think of a film that I've done where it has a a rhythm and a pattern to it where a smile is as poignant as a frown is as poignant as the drum beat is as poignant as a, everything it just worked like the perfect piston running on a machine it was just and that's not that's not any individual that is on mass it is the sum of its parts it was a you know i st I, I watch it now and i'm still choked in past in places because when something works it works every time and every you got i mean everybody everybody from the guy that took the chocks out from the plane to the guy that printed the last dcp it just it it's quite an extraordinary thing i think many thanks to the team behind top gun maverick and thank you to all of the nominees for best sound who have joined us over the course of the past few months for these conversations uh, we wish all of you a great night at the Dolby Theater on March 12th. You can find links to all the films we've discussed today in our show notes, where you can also find the full episodes for each of these conversations. But before you go, please make sure you are subscribed to us, the Dolby Institute podcast. 
We have more of our Academy Awards coverage coming, including our individual episode devoted to cinematography. Once again, your Oscar ballot will thank you for listening to these conversations with these amazing artists. You can find links to our show on all the major podcasting platforms and our show notes, or you can simply search for Dolby wherever you get your podcasts. Until next time, thanks again for joining us. This is the Dolby Institute podcast. I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. Our producer and editor is Michael Coleman. Our executive producers are Amanda Schneider and Jack Ferry, with additional editing by Matt Nixon and production support by Taylor Hines. And our production coordinator is Sonny Chen. Thank you for listening. <laughs>